I want to welcome you all. My name is Bradley Horowitz. I'm VP of Social for Google, uh, Social Product Management. And I'm here today to welcome Sandy Pentland to come and speak with us. I'm going to be brief. Um, I encourage you all to Google Sandy. Uh, you will pull up his long list of credentials, which include uh, academic credentials, business credentials, across many, many disciplines for many, many years. Um, World Economic Forum, Forbes Most Influential, it goes on and on. So I'm going to try to give you a little anecdote of something that I don't think you'll get um, on the web. Nothing too embarrassing. Uh, I, I'm a student, both uh, former and current of Stan Sandy's, uh, former in the sense that I was uh, a Media Lab uh, PhD student, he was my advisor, and uh, current in the sense that I stay closely attuned to everything that Sandy does. Um, as we were walking over here from Building 1900, um, we were sort of doing what old friends do, which is play the name game and checking in on all the old connections and friends that we share. How's Roz doing? How's Stan doing? How's Ali doing? What about Thad? And uh, we went through them, and turns out everybody's doing fine. Uh, you know, many of you are here, actually in the second row, in front row. Um, many of you have gone off to become professors at MIT or Berkeley or Georgia Tech. Um, and it was just so great. And thinking about that for a moment, um, I recognized that I was just walking through one of the vintages, the sort of early 90s vintage of Sandy students who have all gone off to do great things. Um, and Sandy has consecutively piled on top of that round after round of graduate students and, and students that he has inspired. And in addition to all of those lists of accomplishments, one of the things that really touches me most about Sandy and his work is that he's such an inspirational educator. He not only has enthusiasm for his own work, he's able to impart that to others and create generations of people that care passionately about technology and science. And it's just uh, so great to be in the company uh, which we'll all get to share for an hour right now of a person who can inspire and lead that way. And so with that, I'll hand it over to Sandy. Welcome. <laughs> well, thank you. Now, now I have to uh, inspire and cause passion, which is actually part of what I'm going to talk about. So uh, how does that happen? So maybe this is good. Um, so I'm going to talk about two things. One is um, basic science about who people are, how we use electronic media, how we use face-to-face -face media, how we evolved as a social species. And then I want to move to how we can use this knowledge to make things better, to have a more sustainable digital ecology, to make government work. Wouldn't that be amazing? <laughs> and, and so on and so forth. And as, as uh, Bradley mentioned, I do a lot of things. I thought I'd stick this in. I love this picture. This is the Borgs back in the 1990s, and that's Thad in the front there, Thad Starner, who I think most of you know. And then two other things I do that are, are of real relevance here, maybe three, is one is uh, for the last five years, I've run a group, helped run a group at, at Davos around personal data, privacy, and big data. And that's, of course, a, a very relevant topic uh, for this crowd, but particularly going forward. And the group includes people like the chairman of the Federal Trade Commission, the vice president of the EU, Politburo members from China, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a conversation between CEOs of major companies and chief regulators and advocacy. And I'll talk about that at the end and where I think that, that things are going and what you might want to do about it. Um, and I just joined the Google uh, ATAP board because they used to be owned by, by Motorola, but when Motorola got sold, they intelligently moved the a really creative, interesting part over here to Google. And as Bradley mentioned, it started a bunch of companies which are doing well. So the, the thing I'm really concerned about, the thing that's passionate, is making the world work better. And uh, a sort of story for this is about um, 15 years ago, I was setting up a series of laboratories in India and uh, you know we had huge government sponsorship. We had a board of directors, which was some of the brightest, most successful people in the world. And it was a complete disaster. Um, it, and it had to do with a lot of things. It had to do with all of the sort of macho signaling charisma in the room of the board of directors. It also had to do with the way the government failed to work or did work. And looking back on that, I can sort of see the premonitions of the US Congress today. Right? So we went and visited the Indian Congress where uh, we saw people throwing shoes at each other 
and throwing cash in the air. And uh, we look at the US Congress today, and it's, it's somewhat similar, unfortunately. So I want to make things better. And, and what occurs to me is if we knew how to make our organizations work, then we could really do things. Like we could solve global warming tomorrow if we all knew how to sort of talk about it rationally, come to a good decision, and then carry that through. And the, the fact that that sounds like ludicrous fantasy, oh yeah, everybody agrees, sure, not in our lifetime, tells you just how profound the problem is. Um, and that's why I think one of the most important things that's happened in the last decade, something that you've all been part of, is this era of big data, which is not about big at all, it's about personal data. Detailed data about the behavior of every person on Earth, where they go, what they buy, what they say online, all sorts of things like that. Suddenly, we can watch people the way, say, you would watch an anthill, or, or uh, Jane Goodall would watch apes. We can do that. And, and that has profound impact that is hard to appreciate. I made this little graph, which comes out of, uh, inspired by Nadav's thesis here. Um, which is duration of observation. And these are social science experiments and the biggest medical experiments. So this is like the Framingham Heart Study, 30 years, 30,000 people. But they only talk to people like once every three years. So the bit rate was like one number per month. So you had no idea what these people were doing. Well, they could have been eating fried chicken all the time. You don't know, right? Or most of the things we know about psychology come from down here. This is number of bits per second duration. This is a bunch of freshmen in Psych 101 filling out some surveys. And that's what we take to be social science, political science, and medical science. But now we have these new ways of doing things. And so what in my group we've done is we've built little badges, like you all have little name badges. And so we can actually know where you go and who you talk to. And, and we do this with organizations. We'll track everybody for a month. We never listen to the words, but we do know the patterns of communication. And I'll show you a little bit about that. Similarly, we put software in phones, and we look at the patterns of communication within a community. So I'll go into a community and give everybody brand new phones. And some of the people here have been integrally involved in these experiments. And we'll look at their Facebook activity, their credit card record, their sleep pattern, their communication pattern, who they hang with, who they call, and ask, what do all of these communication patterns have to do with the outcomes? Right? Do they spend too much? What things do they choose to buy? And so forth. And what you find from the big data, and of course, modern machine learning sorts of things, is that you can build quantitative, predictive models of human behavior, which you all know, but I think you know the wrong part. And I'm going to tell you about the other part that's much stronger than what you typically do. Okay? And, and so you can predict behavior. And people go, well, wait a second, what about free will? That may not have occurred to you, but that's a traditional thing to ask. And I'll tell you a little bit about that along the way. Because it turns out that a lot of our behavior is very habitual, and that's the part that we can model mathematically. So the big picture here, is, and this is part of the reason I got off onto this research, is I go to places like Davos, and you listen to the president of this and the CEO of that, and when they talk about changing policy, talk about doing anything, they use economics metaphors. And the thing about meta economic metaphors is that they're all about individuals. So you've heard about rational individuals. And everybody rags on the rational part. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to rag on the individual part. Okay? Because I don't think we are individuals. What we desire, the ways we learn to go about doing it, what's valuable, are consensual things. So they actually aren't captured by this sort of model, this independent model. That matters because those interactions are the sources not only of fads and economic bubbles, but they're really the social fabric that we live in. So everybody knows about the invisible hand. They're led by an invisible hand to advance the interest of society. What that means is that markets are supposed to allocate things efficiently and fairly, right? If you've thought about it, you know this doesn't work in the real world. Okay, uh, And the question is, why? Um, so one of the things that, that there's several things to say about this. Most people think that this statement is something that he made in The Wealth of, of Nations, Adam Smith made in The Wealth of Nations. But it's not. He made it in a book called Moral Sentiments, which very few people read. 
And it went on to say something very different. It went on to say that it's human nature to exchange not only goods, but ideas, assistance, and favors. And it's these exchanges that guide people to create solutions for the good of the community. So Adam Smith did not believe that markets were socially efficient. He believed that it was the social fabric of relationships that caused the pressures of the market to be allocated where they're needed. And in fact, a lot of mathematicians believe now that this sort of, despite Nobel Prizes about market efficiency and markets being good for governance, um, it's not. It's really, you have to have the right sort of regulation and reputation mechanism. But this is another solution. Adam Smith, way back when, said, if we could model the peer-to-peer -peer relationships, we could understand how social, how market things eventually resolve to be much more efficient. And that's what we're doing. We're doing something that you could call sort of economics 2.0. Instead of the individual approximation, we're now modeling not only individual behavior, but peer-to-peer -peer behavior at the same time. So that's the sort of big context for what's up here. So let me give you an example of what that means. So in a typical situation, you have some people that influence each other. So you know, their political views, it's what's cool to do. You pick it up from the people around you. And we have a lot of evidence from this, from the experiments we've done in our group, uh, showing that people's attitudes about you know, what music to listen to, what apps to download, what be spending behavior to have is largely predicted by their exposure to what other people do. Now, you may not want to believe this because it's not the rhetoric in our society, and you guys are the last people to be saying this to because you guys are like the best and smartest in the world, but it really is true that about 50% of the variance comes from these peer-to-peer -peer relationships. And we know that when we do incentives, when we try these, these CEOs and governors try to set up governance schemes to make people do things, they always talk about individual incentives. That's part of this mindset that comes from the 1700s is that we're all rational individuals. So we'll give this guy money to behave differently. But if, when you do that, what happens is, of course, you're putting that incentive in opposition to the social pressure he gets from other people. And if they're aligned, it works wonderfully. But if they're not aligned, which happens all the time, Incentives don't work. Individual incentives don't work. And the moment the incentive goes away, you know, you stop paying them, they revert to what the social fabric does. So when you begin to think about this mathematical framework that includes the social fabric, an obvious thing occurs to you, which is, is that, well, instead of giving one person the incentive, maybe I can modify the social fabric. What we have is exchanges between people, and we have incentives being applied to the individuals. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to modify the incentives between the people. Okay? And you can write down these equations just the way you write down economic equations. So this was in um, uh, Nature Scientific Reports just last year. So you can write it all down you know, with utilities and peer pressure and externality costs. And you discover something interesting. is When you add these second order terms in, you find that Incentives that modify the interactions are generically more than twice as efficient as incentives that go to individuals. Generically that way. And in the data that I'll show you, it's sort of 4 to 20 times more powerful. So this is the thing that I want to really get across to you, is that the sort of power of economics that has mathematics and prediction is very limited. It doesn't include anything that has strong peer-to-peer -peer effects like bubbles, like fads. And, but you can now write those down because we have enough data and enough math to be able to do it. So let me give you some examples of what that means. These are simple examples. You can do much more complicated ones. So this was, again, sort of done in the Dobbs thesis. Um, we got a community where we divided them into two pieces. It's actually three pieces, but I'll just talk about two pieces. In one piece, we had a little app that showed them how active they were. And this was in the winter in Boston where people tend to just put the blanket over their head and go away, right? So we wanted them to get out and around and stuff. And so we could show them their activity level and we could give them money. So you could say, oh, if I was more active than last week, I made three bucks. It's wonderful, okay? But in the other part of the community, we assigned people buddies. 
And you would be his buddy. If he's more active, you get rewarded. Not him, you. Your buddy gets rewarded for you being active. And what you do is you pick people that have a lot of interactions with each other to do this. And it sounds a little creepy, but actually people got into it. Almost everybody signed up for it. And what you got is you got everybody's like looking at the other guy and saying, well, are you being active? Because they're reminded on their phone all the time, and they're getting a couple bucks for it. It's no, not, not a big thing, OK? But remember that that incentive scheme, that social network scheme, where I'm not incenting the individuals, I'm incenting the network, is generically more than twice as efficient. In fact, in this experiment, the way we did it, we found it was four times more efficient. And if we'd done it the right way, if we went back and did it again, as sort of a post hoc analysis, we would have gotten eight to 10 times more efficient. Okay, Pretty interesting. Oh, and one other thing, it's stuck. When we ran out of money, we turned off the money, no more incentives. People kept being more active for the period that we could observe. Okay, Because what we'd done is change the social fabric. We'd made being active a topic of conversation, a topic of social pressure, of prestige, of interest. And of course, that has momentum to it. Here's another example that's online. We went to a canton in Switzerland which was trying to save power, keep power below a certain uh, uh, level. Because they had hydroelectric power up to one level. And beyond that, they had to turn on diesels. And noisy, expensive, polluting. And they tried educating people. And they tried financial incentives. And nothing really worked. And so we convinced them to sign people up as buddies. So you would sign up with him as your buddy. And if you saved energy, he would get a reward. Now, the rewards were like pathetic. They were like, the budget was 50 cents per week, OK? And little dancing bears on your website. It was like really stupid. But it, what happened is, is that for the people that signed up, you got a 17% reduction in energy usage. Now, that sounds good, but let me give you the comparable. There have been some places where people have raised prices to get 17% reduction. On average, you have to double the price of energy to get that reduction in energy use. That's the price elasticity curve. So for 50 cents a week, we could get the same effect as doubling the, uh, uh, the price. Or this one is by a friend of mine, James Fowler, done with Facebook in 2010. Um, he sent 61 million people a message about getting out and voting in the election. Um, the, the sort of simple summary of it is it had almost no effect. People didn't do it. A few people did it. He could go back and sample people and say, you know, how many people did this have an effect? He also included a I voted button, which would then show your face to your Facebook friends. Okay? This also had no effect, except with one particular class of people, which is the people you had strong face-to-face -face relationships with. If you appeared in the same images with this other person regularly, then among that group, that I voted button would generate two to three more people voting. So greater than yield one, a cascade of behavior. So again, what's happening there is social pressure, the peer-to-peer -peer things. The centralized thing didn't do it. It was peer-to-peer -peer pressure between people with strong ties. And in fact, actually, it's not captured by the electronic network at all. These were things that were outside of that. Okay. So that's an example that I think is really interesting and you can build on. Um, as somebody mentioned, actually, how many of you know the Red Balloon Contest? Galen knows it. <laughs> He's the first author. OK. But so, so DARPA had this you know, social network grand challenge where we had to find 10 red balloons somewhere in the US. And uh, everybody tried using the economic incentives. You, know, you get some money if you found a balloon and reported it. We used something like this mechanism we're able to recruit what we estimate to be about 2 million people in 24 hours and one. Again, not giving people directly the incentive. In that case, it's a little more complicated, but giving people these peer-to-peer -peer things. So that's cool. Why do you think humans are this way? Well, let me give you an example that I think really tells us why the action is not between our ears. The action is in our social networks. Okay? We are a social species. We evolved that way. Why? Let me give you a really graphic 
example of that. So this is a site called eToro. It's a social network site. On this site, people buy and sell dollars and euros and gold and silver and stuff like that. Okay? And unlike almost every other trading platform, it's a social platform. So I can see what every other person, what every other these 1.6 million people are doing. I can't see the dollar amount, but I can see that they're shorting euros, long dollar, leverage 25, right? One day contract. And I can see how much money they made at the end. I can see their return on investment. So here are people playing with their own money, substantial amounts of their own money, millions of them all over the world, doing this very regularly, sort of average maybe one a day, that sort of transaction, right? Couple, maybe a couple days. And we can make a graph of the social network. And that's what this is. This is 1.6 million people. These are the one, same 1.6 million people. And wherever there's a dot, this person decided to follow this other person. And following eToro has a different meaning than Facebook. Follow means I'm going to take 10% of my money, and whatever that person does, my 10% of the money will be invested exactly the same way. So this is follow with teeth, OK? And this is the graph of following. So these are people learning from each other, looking at each other's strategies, and trading. And you see some people are going it alone. They read the newspaper. They look at the wire. They browse the web. Then they trade. Other people are in this orgy of social dialogue, right? All following each other. And in fact, if you look at it, you see that there are all these loops in there. So you know, I follow you. You follow him. He follows me. Uh-oh. <laughs> and what happens in this loop is that you get very few new ideas. It's the same ideas going around and around. And this is the sort of thing that's a precursor of an economic bubble. Now, the question is, is which of these sort of social strategies gives greater return on investment? Why are we a social uh, species? The way people always, almost always analyze it is greater information. But these guys all read the newspapers and everything. They have all the information in the world. Okay? These guys read the same newspapers and everything, but they also look at each other. What would you expect to happen? Well, you can write down the equations here. And what you can do is you can look at the propagation of new strategies across this population. So when this guy comes up with a new thing to do, how likely is it to propagate throughout the social network? And in that way, you can quantify the number and diversity of new strategies any one person sees. These people will see about no new strategies because they're all on their own. These people will see very few new strategies because they're all listening to each other. It's the same thing around and around. And these people are much more diverse. If we look at the return on investment, we get a curve like this. So again, this is a mathematical function that has to do with the number of new strategies. So the rate of propagation of strategies through the medium, the social network. Um, if you look at the number of new things, this is very low. This is very low. This has many new types of strategies. And this vertical axis is return on investment. So this is like one of these no BS types of measures, OK? Real people, their own money, doing it on their own choice, making money or not. People who trade by themselves are market neutral. You might expect that on average. They are the market. Uh, they lose a little bit of money in trading costs. People who are in these uh, momentum echo chambers don't do very well either. And what isn't shown here is sometimes there are crashes that blow them all up. So they actually do pretty badly on a, over a long term. And people in the middle make 30% more money. So this is not something that is in traditional economics. What we're talking about here is a blend of social strategies for learning from other people plus individual information. It's the peer-to-peer -peer interactions. And probably the reason that we have a social species, this learning from each other, is because it has this much more efficient output. And there's a big literature about this. I'm, don't just believe me. This is a wonderful example because I can quantify it. And every dot here is all the trades by millions of people for a whole day. So this is like more data than you know, right? And if I did just one asset class, like dollars versus uh, euros, it wouldn't have this, the spread that it does. It would be a nice band. So as you get more diverse learning from your social environment, your return on investment goes up. 
until you begin getting too many loops and then it goes back down. Now, I like this example because I think this example applies to government. It applies to making decisions in companies. If you begin thinking about it, we're all living these social networks and what we're trying to do is make good decisions. Here I'm showing you that a mixture of social learning plus individual learning, and I can tell you a lot more about it, it's in the book, gets you better decisions. And not just better decisions by one person, this is better decisions of the entire 1.6 million people. That's a really different thing. I should also mention that one of the things we did with this platform is when we discovered that they were in this echo chamber state, that's not good for the platform or them, okay? Everyone's gonna lose money. So we looked at the loop structure and we figured out how best, what the optimal way to break it up was. And we gave coupons to key people, a small group of key people that would cause this echo chamber to break up in an optimal manner. And that doubled the return on investment of the people in the entire network. And that lasted for about three days, four days, and then they went back to being stupid again. But <laughs> that's their problem. We've done this sort of repeatedly. We know it works. So you can actually control the flow of ideas in a network like this and improve the average function of the people in the network. It's a very different way of thinking about things than the normal way. Because you're not concerned about individuals. You're not concerned about their education or their decision making. You're concerned about the pattern of learning and the performance of the ensemble rather than the individuals. So one of the other things that, that this big data tells us is that this process can be broken up into two pieces. And to illustrate that, I'll show this diagram that's from Danny Kahneman's Nobel Prize lecture. He's the father of behavioral economics. And he makes the point that people have two ways of thinking. There's a slow way of thinking. People probably know his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, very popular. Slow way of thinking that's the serial reasoning that we do. Um, and there's this fast way of thinking, which is associations. You take the experience you have, you say, how is this a th situation like my previous experiences? Maybe you interpolate a little bit, and you make a decision. Very, very fast. This is a very old mechanism, 100, 200 million years old. This is pretty much unique to humans. Interestingly, this is the much better mechanism by far if you have the right set of experiences. If you don't have the right set of experiences, this is a, a disaster waiting to happen because you're going to associate the wrong things with the wrong things and you'll fall right off the cliff. And when I look at the learning that people have from each other in these social networks, I see a qualitatively different type of behavior. So when I look at slow learning, so this is learning that people integrate into their conscious representations. So you, the new song you heard, the new fact, the new product that came out. People are very promiscuous about this. It only takes one exposure to integrate that into your ensemble of things you know about. And this is the way almost everything that you guys build is based on. Oh, we're gonna have more information, right? But information is not behavior. It turns out that to get behavior change, which is what I call idea flow, you need something different. So this is an exploration where you're trying to find new possibilities and new facts, but it's relatively isolated from behavior change. You can learn about all sorts of things and never change your behavior. This is why it's hard to stop smoking. This is why it's hard to stop overeating. Why all sorts of things are hard is that our habits, our actual behaviors that reside here, are largely independent of this. Now, it, there's some leakage. If you concentrate real hard, some early adopters, yes, it does happen. But as I showed with the voting experiment, the transfer from here to here is very weak. On the other hand, what is the case is that if you see multiple people experimenting with the same idea, people whom you have strong relationships with, then you will with very high certainty be able tend to adopt that behavior. Okay, so what you're doing is this social learning. If I see for some of my peers that doing this results in a better outcome, then without even thinking about it, I'll begin to adopt that. If I hear about it, you know, through email or on the web or something, it's very unlikely. We have uh, a database of all of, um, I can't say the name of the company, but a competitor bought it. 
for a billion dollars. It's a social network for inside companies. Um, so we have the deployment for over a thousand companies in there using that social network. And what we find can be summed up in an interesting statistic. If you get invitations to join this intra-company uh, social network from as many as 12 people in half an hour, you're still unlikely to sign up. Unless those people are people you already have strong relationships with. If they're people you know face to face or people you work with regularly, then as few as three invitations makes it almost certain that you'll sign up. So that's just like the voting thing. It's what I'm talking about here. Behavior change, which is what you usually care about, has to do with this social reinforcement mechanism that I call engagement. It's community vetting of ideas and behaviors that results in the adoption of the new behavior. It's not the broadcast effect that we often think about. So let me show you an example of this. So this is data from a German bank. It has five departments, managers, uh, development, sales, support, customer service is the last one. And this is all the email. And the red stuff is all the face-to-face. -face. We get this off of little badges we put on people. So you probably can track this stuff, but you've never tracked the face-to-face -face stuff. Nobody does. And what we find is that um, the sort of punchline is, is that the email, the pattern of email, has very little to do with productivity or creative output. But the pattern of rich channels of communication has a huge amount. So I'll show you a slightly distracting thing first, and then I'll tell you the, the real punchline here. So these guys are going to do an ad campaign. They're starting now. The boss sends out lots of email. They have lots of meetings to figure out how to do it. During that time, nobody talks to customer service. They deploy the thing. It's a disaster. And as a consequence, they deploy it now. And then they have all-day meetings with customer service to figure out how to fix it. Okay? So the real punchline, because we've done some dozens of companies now, is that you can see the pattern of rich channel communication. And that predicts typically 30 and sometimes 40% of the variation in productivity of work groups. 30 to 40% is bigger by far than anything that you look at. I mean, you'd have to like kill the people to get that big of, a, of an effect. And the mathematical formulation of it is basically a probability that if I talk to you and I talk to you, what's the likelihood that you two also talk to each other? It's those loops. And it's this learning from each other, keeping people in the loop, nice little mathematical relationship that predicts this productivity. And there's another thing. So that's that engagement I was talking about. There's another which is exploration. And that's the stuff that your boss tells you is not in your job description. That's going to talk to the people in sales or the janitors or the people at the other company. Just picking up new ideas, new facts, new observations, and bringing them back to your work group to bang against each other and see if they make sense to do that social learning process. Okay? I wrote a paper for um, Harvard Business Review uh, that lays this out. Um, it's called The New Science of Building Great Teams. And it won Paper of the Year Award, which is nice. But it also won Paper of the Year from the Academy of Management, which is the academic side. And that's the first time, I believe, that Harvard Business Review and the academic business guys have ever agreed. So <laughs> maybe it's worth taking a look at. Anyway, so that's companies. Let's look at the real world. So this is a company I helped found in 2006. Sold to AT&T's mobile advertising spin out recently. People moving around in San Francisco. Big dots are the most popular places. Maybe some of you guys have seen this before. I like it, so I show it often. Looks like a nicely mixed city, but actually if you analyze them, if you cluster people by their paths and by their exposure to each other, what you find is you find that it's a very segregated city. There's these groups of people that hardly ever are exposed to each other. And then there's other groups within the group. They don't know each other, but they go to the same places, they see the same things, and they have the same habits. So in other words, they have very strong engagement within the groups, and they learn habits of behavior from that. Now sometimes that's good. So for instance, uh, sometimes it's sort of trivial. It's like you might discover that one group here, you get a fad for red dresses. No particular reason. It's just what people in this group do. Okay? 
In another group, though, what you find is you find that they have a different attitude about paying back credit cards than maybe you do. And so they don't have such good risk scores. Again, it's not anything that they thought about. It's just what people in that group do. They learn from each other. And so Joe just like threw it away, got a new one. Nobody came after him. It's the smart thing to do, right? And then the other thing that you find, which is very important, is chronic diseases vary by group because of behavior. Chronic diseases are mostly a function of your behavior. You eat too much, you drink too much, you don't exercise enough, all those things. And a lot of other things we don't know. And we don't know why that particular group is susceptible to diabetes, but we know they're very much more susceptible than other people. It seems to be that they've learned bad habits from each other. Okay. So, I'm going to give a TED talk in a little bit, so I thought I'd put this in. So what TED does, you know, his idea is worth spreading, right? Make these wonderful videos, blast them out to everybody. And what that's doing is it's increasing people's exploration. You get a million views of this little movie, da 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 da, right? But it doesn't change behavior. That's my prediction. That's what I see in all of this data. What changes behavior is all the peer-to-peer -peer communication that comes afterwards where you say, what do you think of that? Another guy says, oh yeah, that's awesome. And then the third guy says, well, okay. And, and you get this validation among your peer group. And that's what leads you to actually change your behavior. So if you like what I'm saying, if you think it's interesting, talk to your peer group. Right? <laughs> Maybe it'll change your behavior. So you can actually do something interesting today which is you can use these ideas to map stuff in entire cities. So this is um, mixing of different communities in Mexico. And I should start it over again. So the red stuff is where the most mixing happens. And the green stuff, the yellow stuff, is where very little mixing happens. And if it's blank, we don't have the data. So you can see on Sundays, there's very little mixing. People stay home. Monday, a lot of people come out. So According to the things that I've told you, it's this mixing between communities that's the source of a lot of the innovation and creative uh, output in a community. It's the banging together of ideas that causes innovation and better social outcomes. And you can outdo this. And this is just cell tower activity. This is not any personal data at all. This is just at the level of cell towers. You say, well, where did this person, you know, which people come which parts of the community do the people at this cell tower come from? Okay, you don't know the individual people. But you can use this in interesting ways. If I use that same method, this is something we did in the Ivory Coast. I helped convince the carrier Orange release all of their cell tower data for the Ivory Coast. Ivory Coast is a very poor country that also had a civil war. So the government can't go in the northern half of the country. Um, what they do is they have poverty statistics for the lower half. And using this method, you can fit the statistics for poverty in the lower half and extrapolate them to the upper half. And the, the, the poverty that you're measuring is interesting. So this is, has to do with two factors. It's this exploration outside the community and engagement within the community. Okay? And so this MPI is, is a, a, a multi-factor thing. And it's a combination of poverty, but also life expectancy, crime, and infant mortality because they all co-vary with one another. So that's an example. So you saw it with Mexico City. You see it here. This is something a former student of mine, um, Nathan Eagle, did. Um, he took all the data from councils in the UK. So these are neighborhoods that are administrative units in the UK. And he looked at their socioeconomic outcome index, which is, again, poverty, crime, infant mortality, and stuff, and compared it to the landline phone records and measured two things, which are very similar to what I call exploration and engagement, and generated this graph. So when you get a community that doesn't talk to itself and doesn't talk much outside of itself, all the babies die. Well, not all the babies, a lot of babies die. When you get a community where they're richly integrated into the rest of society and they talk among themselves, very few babies die. And of course, this is a richer community, that's a poor community, that has less crime, that has more crime. So we've seen this now in several places. We've seen it in, London, in England, 
We've seen it in Ivory Coast. We've seen it in Cambridge. And you can begin doing things with this. So for instance, you can use this to be able to predict GDP in cities. So we took the GDP for 150 cities in Europe and 150 cities in the US, and we measured the amount of banging together of ideas that you got in rich channels of communication, face-to-face -face primarily. And we did that by using things like Foursquare to ask how often do people come together from different communities and at what distances. And you can fit a nice mathematical function. It's, it's the same form in Europe as it is in the US. Uh, it varies by the density of the city and the transportation infrastructure. So if it's a very dense city with a really good transportation infrastructure, you run into a lot of different people. There's a lot of ideas banging together. And you get a lot of innovation. And so what this is showing is a measure of this face-to-face -face engagement and exploration. And this is GDP per head, or per kilometer, I think, actually, that one is. And you can see that it accounts for around 90% of the variance, which in social science is like a you know, law from above or something like that. In other words, if you tell me the density of the city and the transportation infrastructure, and actually you just need to tell me the average commute time, I can tell you the GDP almost perfectly. Similarly, if I tell you the mobility or the call pattern in a neighborhood, I can tell you the GDP, the number of infant mortalities, and the crime rate. Again, R squared of about 0.85. It's like a law. It's amazing. Okay? And that opens up the possibility of doing cool things. You could, for instance, change the infrastructure to make more ideas bang together. Right? You could make it so it's easy to get around in a place like New York or San Francisco, as opposed to an incredible pain in the butt. Right? And so, you know. We at MIT have done things like this shared car, and shared scooter. I'm on the advisory board for Nissan and uh, helping them build the first, uh, what we hope to be the first autonomous vehicle, uh, commercial autonomous vehicle, right? Because um, we actually built one. I helped build one almost 20 years ago, but it was never deployed uh, uh, commercially. Uh, and so now we're going to, the CEO says we're going to do it. So that's one way. But the thing I think is most, uh, so let me back up. So, so this is a tool we built at MIT. This is uh, Kent Larson and Ryan Chin primarily, which allows you to simulate things. So this is actually the area around MIT Media Lab. That's the Media Lab there. Um, so they built out of Legos. And they have a laser range finder, which scans the 3D thing. And then you do some computation, and you project back what ought to happen. So like, for instance, you can check ba project back how the wind will go or traffic patterns. But you can also project back things like anticipated uh, creative output. How many different ideas are going to bang together? Are all the communities in little silos, or are they actually mixing? So this is something I'm sure people who plan these buildings talk about all the time, but you never measure it. And yet, all the data say that's the source of real creative output. It's also the source of getting everybody on the same page. You have to mix those two things. So while we're beginning to build interactive tools uh, to do that. So another way which probably resonates more with this group is this, which is trading ideas with each other electronically rather than face-to-face. -face. Rich channels like face-to-face -face are important, but you can supplement them. You can extend them in various ways by better data sharing. And, and to a certain degree, that's why people call personal data the new oil of the internet, because all those personal experiences are not only good for learning peer-to-peer, -peer, they're also good for advertising and lots of other things. And um, as I think I've shown you, it also is something that worries a lot of people and could be used in very bad ways. And so about five years ago, I helped start a group at Davos, which included people like the chairman of the Federal Trade Commission, um, uh, Justice Commissioner of the EU, people from the Politburo in China, uh, CEOs of things like Vodafone, Microsoft, et cetera, um, to be able to talk about these problems. And so what we were looking for was a win-win-win solution where citizens would feel protected and be able to see more value from their data and from trading information, where companies would be able to make money, and where governments would be able to be, provide public goods, be able to make a more resilient society cyber resistance, and so forth. 
And the nice thing, this is the sort of diagram they do at Davos. Well, people speak, some incredibly talented artist draws the discussion. You can't really interpret it, but it's just amazing to see them do it. Um, but the bottom line was is that the, the ideas that came out of that, uh, which are now enshrined in the uh, Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights in this country and the privacy directives in the EU and are being considered in China, have to do with changing the way we treat data, personal data, these sort of personal stories in a, a, a very fundamental way. And that's to put much more control in the hands of the individual um, through notification that people are collecting data about you, informed consent, that means you show them what the data is, you describe to them what the value they're going to get from sharing is, and they opt in to that particular use, and then they can opt out if they don't like it. Auditing to make sure that you did what you said you were going to do, and that's the retraction I've always talked about. So, so that's where things are going. Um, in anticipation of that, I got DARPA to give us a lot of money to build an infrastructure like this, uh, because they wouldn't do much except small experiments. But in this country, I got Trento in Italy to, to be a living lab, to try and live in the future by giving citizens more control over their data using this infrastructure in conjunction with Telecom Italia, Telefonica, uh, the local government, and, and so on. And the experiment is to be able to say, if people have a repository, a copy of all the data that's about them, and that risk reward ratio is different because they can opt into things and they know what they're opting into. They can opt out. They can audit it. You've changed the risk reward ratio. Will the sharing go up? Will companies make more money? Will people do more sharing? Will you get greater innovation through that sharing of ideas and information? Will government be able to do a better job at providing public goods? And so we've deployed this for the last year and a half. Um, it has many sort of technical elements. Uh, some of the ones that I'm proud about is we talked MITRE, uh, which is a government defense contractor, to releasing uh, something called OpenID Connect as an open source uh, uh, identity mechanism that's really quite state of the art, is now being supported by MIT Kerberos Consortium as uh, going to be, their intent is to make it a basic element of internet security. Um, if you are interested in this stuff, you should take a look at it. And also trust network technologies, whereby it's a combination of law and computer code that give people more control and auditability over personal data. Uh, an example of this that you might be familiar with is the SWIFT network, which is for interbank transfer. So the SWIFT network handles $3 trillion of money a day. And as far as we know, it's never been hacked, despite operating in, I think, in 164 different countries and with a lot of dodgy banks. And it has to do with the marriage between the sharing protocols and the, the legal contract, which is a consumer contract. It's not special regulation. It's just contract law. Uh, the, the close match between that. So the communications it begin with the offer of a contract, the signing of the contract. It's auditable. There's joint liability, so everybody's watching out for everybody else. And it seems to work. The Visa network is a similar sort of thing. Some of this is used in the federal government for medical um, uh, data sharing. And one of the things that's particular about our solution, and I know this is too quick, but I'm hopefully there's people that are interested in this, is that like the SWIFT network, um, we don't provide sharing of data except in extreme. So generally, there's no reason to share data. What you want to do is you want to share answers to questions, or you want to share stories. You want to say, oh yes, I'm in San Francisco, not I'm at this lat long or I'm in San Francisco today, not lat long at 3.15 PM. So by providing the most sort of general story elements possible, you get the commercial opportunities, the public good opportunities, with much, much less exposure in terms of, of raw data sharing and unintended uses. It's not a perfect answer, but it's a good answer. So we've deployed this in Trento. We're deploying it at MIT. Um, we could do it other places. I'm going to tell you just a little bit about the basic architecture, but then I see I'm running too long, right? So I am, yeah, so I won't tell you too much. There is an architecture. The cool thing about this is once people have personal data stores, 
you can spin up applications trivially. There's no collecting the data to get bootstrapped. The data is already there. Right? So we're doing this with Mass General Hospital. We're doing it with lots of other people where um, you know, when you opt in day one, it has a whole history of you because you've been storing all that data. Anyway, so taking too long, sorry. Um, big data, better life. That's what we're about. Um, the book describes all this in detail. Thank you. So you show these beautiful correlations between some outcome for a society and the number of interactions, right? And I'm wondering, is there uh, strong evidence of, of causality there? Like, for instance, if we just tweaked how much interaction was going on in a given society, would that in and of itself escalate it? So we know that it's causal in small groups and in like groups of 100 people, because we've done interventions. We don't know that it's causal in big groups. But you can look at, for instance, the architecture of lots and lots of different cities, and it makes a certain amount of sense. You see the same pattern. That's, of course, why it fits so well. Basically, what you're talking about is the sort of the Jane Jacobs solution, which is small communities with very good transportation infrastructure between them. A small community where you can walk around gives you this strong engagement and culture and, and, and social support. And the very good transportation infrastructure lets communities interact with each other. That's, that's the way the design shakes out, basically. So we think it's causal. Uh, we don't know. We're trying to work with cities to show that it is. So I work in privacy, and uh, I liked your remarks on notification, informed consent, uh, auditing, and the rest. What do you think uh, about uh, actual automatic exploration of such? Uh, I think that's a great idea. Why would, would, it, get... would, it, would it increase the value over a long time, or would it have a negative effect to the value of society over a long time? I think it's one of these things that you have to experiment with, but I would expect it would increase it. I mean. The, you know, the fundamental thing is risk reward, right? You want to know what's going on, so you don't want to be spied on. You want to have control over it. And you want to be able to share an expectation of a return without a lot of downside. So expiration means that it's un less likely to spread. Um, auditing means that it's less likely to get stolen. It still will sometimes. But you know, what it is really is it's a framework that's a lot like our financial network, our banking. You know, you have these strings of numbers that are the amount of money that you have, and you give it to this thing called a bank, and then you can look at it, and the federal government comes and audits them, and you can take it out if you don't like it. And so we're talking about that with, with personal data, where I put it in a bank, and I say, I will give it to these people in return for these sorts of things, and if I don't like what you do with it, I'll take it back. And then the next objection is, well, isn't this too complicated? And yes, it is too complicated. That's why we have things like mutual funds and 401ks and junk like that, is because it's just way too complicated for a human. But you'd have the same sort of thing with personal data. The AARP would have a, a standard way for elderly people to share data that is deemed safe. Specifically, what I mean is I opt in into something, but that opt-in is not treated as in, indefinite. It should you know, be, absolutely. The, the opt-in should be part of the contract that it expires, and, right? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I had a quick question about the trying to break up the, the investment trading circles. Um, is there a reason you chose an individual incentive to try to break up the social networks? Or was that was just the easiest way to try to break those up? So we tried several different things. One was just giving, first of all, they're not individual incentives. What it is is saying, here's a coupon if you follow that person. So it's saying, build a link in the social graph. It's not like you think about it more or something like that. So we tried several things. One is we gave people random coupons. So just pay attention to a random person. That did nothing. We gave people coupons to pay attention to the highest performing people. That did something. That increased uh, returns by about 2%. And then we took people that were targeted to break up the feedback loops. And that was the thing that had this much larger effect. Okay. But notice that it wasn't an incentive for any particular person to do well. Like some of the people we gave coupons will did less well, okay? But I don't really care. What it did is it broke up the loops, and that the average performance went up higher. 